Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to The Sip. Uh, this is a show hosted by us interns here at the California Academy of Sciences. We're from the Summer Systematics Institute. That's why it's called The, the Sip. So um, grab a coffee, grab a tea. This is our second live streaming session of the day. And unfortunately, my co-host Noah is having some Wi-Fi issues. So he's, he's trying to join right now. Um, so if I am a little bit spacey, excuse excuse the the spaciness uh, because I, I will be trying to figure out how to get him joined here, but you know, it's okay. We'll figure it out. Hopefully we'll see him soon. If not, you'll see him in the next live stream. Um, and I think he just joined. Wow, wow. I literally said your name and you were like, I'm here, <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Hi Noah. <laughs> how are you guys? Good, how are you Noah? I'm doing great. Here I was having technical issues, but I'm back with you, yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah. Noah, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Oh, yes. I'm Noah, and I'm from Ecuador, but originally, but, and, oh, well, I live in New York City. I go to one of the CUNY schools here in New York, New York what is called like uh, Queen's College. Yeah. And yes, fun to be here. Welcome, Amber. Yeah. Welcome, Amber. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And um, yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Aria. I'm Noah's co-host. Uh, I am based in the Bay Area, but I go to school in San Diego. And a reminder that this is a live stream. So if you do have questions, comments, anything like that, feel free to drop them in the chat comment section uh, and we will get to them eventually. But yeah, with that, our special guest, Amber, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Tell us about yourself. Yeah. Hi, my name is Amber Mundy, and I am currently an intern with lovely Aria and Noah. Um, so I live in the D.C. area. I'm about 40 minutes out from D.C., so I go there all the time. And I currently attend Virginia Tech, and this is my last semester in the fall, so I'm about to graduate. So excited. I get to graduate a little bit early just because I took um, a bunch of credits. And so my main major is a little bit weird, so I'm criminology and sociology, but that's just what I came in with. And it was too late to switch my major, but so basically I'm making up for it by just taking a bunch of biology classes. I'm basically a bio major. And I always loved biology from like the start of my life. Uh, I told some of the interns before, but I used to want to be a like a volcanologist and like play with volcanoes and like learn how they work. But now I have turned my biology interest in forensics and basically conservation. So I do a lot of work with um, like water quality conservation, like the Clean Water Act. So I'm just all over the place. I love, love, love every type of science. So very excited to be here and talk about my love for science. Yeah, we love a well-rounded queen. Yeah, oh, Amber, are you there? Okay, there you are. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so, okay, with that, we will just jump in with our first set of questions. Noah, you want to kick us off? Sure. The first question is, uh, what is something that inspires you and inspires you the most about your summer research project? Can you tell us about your project? Yeah. Oh yeah, so what inspires me about this project specifically? Well, what I really like about working with, by the way, the organism I work with this summer is nudibranch, which are basically sea slugs for those who don't know. They're part of the mollusk tasca, and I have a couple more information on this later. But what inspires me about this project a lot is how looking at nudibranchs and their population density can tell you about like the environment they're in. So with the ones I work with, with Dr. Cherry Gosler, they look at the nudibranchs in the Philippines and they determine how many nudibranchs are in each area to direct conservation efforts. And so I really love that because you're directly looking at ways to make changes and I'm all about direct change and helping the environment. So I really like that we are not just like looking at it from like a, oh, maybe this will help, but they're doing it directly to decide which conservation efforts they should put in and where they should do it. And I really, that just inspires me because it's really nice to be amongst people who care about the environment and want to make changes because a lot of people don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like, um, like prioritizing which species to conserve over, uh, not like over others, but like where to direct yeah, attentions to first? Specifically the area. So they have data for okay. new rank from like every year. And so with this one, I'm looking at, at what islands or certain islands has the most densely populated like species of nudibranchs. So like 
I think one island is Luzon Island, which has a certain amount of rings and comparing it to another coral reef and seeing which one they should direct conservation efforts to, to help preserve like the natural flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, you can go. So they're just like, it's basically like where more nudibranch are, it, there's definitely higher levels of diversity of other species. So basically they just direct their conservation efforts there. Huh. Oh, that's super cool. And I guess like, uh, do we know why nudibranchs as like a measure of how diverse an area in particular works really well? Yeah, I was doing a little bit of research on it and I think it's because nudibranchs, especially if you look at a nudibranch, they're very colorful and each species looks very different. So you can tell by what they're eating. And so what they're eating gives you indicators of how many species are there too. And so if you have different colored nudibranchs and many different species, it will tell you that they have different types of foods they're eating. And so that lets you know there's more species there because if there's enough food there to support the nudibranchs living there, then that will indicate that there's more there. And so that's basically how I interpreted it. it. I'm still doing more research with my own research head, but that's an interesting way I saw that. Because if you look, and I'm gonna show some nudibranchs later, they, they're they kind of like flamingos where whatever they eat determines their skin color. And so you have like blue nudibranch, pink, brightly orange colored. So those are all different species. So it's really cool how by looking at what they eat, it indicates the amount of diversity in an area. Yeah. Wait, okay, actually, can we pull up some of those pictures of nudibranchs? Do you want to yes. click through your slides here um, to pull up some of those photos? Because I am super excited to see. Yeah, so this is, Amber was kind enough to put together some really cute pictures. Um, so yeah, do you want to tell us about what nudibranchs are? Because it's kind of a unfamiliar. Yeah, let me actually go to the slide real quick. I have a whole, I have pictures of me on it that I'll show later, but then I also have um, <laughs> all about nudibranch. And so like I was mentioning before, nudibranchs belong to the phylum mollusca, or mollusk, and they are invertebrates. And what I have here, the gastropoda, the osteoprobranchia, and the nudibranchia, it's basically how I'm looking at the project right now and determining um, how many species are there. So it starts with the hierarchy of the gastropoda, goes to the osteobranchia and the nudibranchia. And that's just how I'm looking at it. And I can show you the slide database that the Academy kindly provides. But also fun fact that I just assumed is that nudibranch are carnivores, which I don't know why I just thought that, oh, they just eat plants. They have to eat other things to get their, their bright colors. But I just... The word carnivore, I always just associate with like lions and like vicious. Animals. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's almost like nudibranch being carnivores. It's shocking, but they eat like algae, coral, and like small bugs and shrimp. And these are like tiny sea slugs, right? Yeah, nudibranch, they're the, the biggest they are is like I found was like a foot, but they're most of the time they're like very, very, very minuscule little things. And so they hide in like tide pools along the coast of San Francisco. And I just think that's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna hunt for them one day and just find a bunch of nudibranch. Are, are they, oh, I have a question. Oh yeah, what's your question, sorry. Are they just found in like San Francisco or there is more like- oh, A lot of them are found on the coast of the Philippines actually. Oh. So what my research head was telling me is that there's nearly 1,000 species of nudibranchs, but almost half of them are found on the coast of the Philippines. Wow, nudibranchs are a lot of places, but there is a lot on the coast of San Francisco too, which is, of course, where the academy belongs. And so are you can they, them in little are, pools. Are they endemic to that place, or? Um, um not. I wouldn't. Mm, kind of. I know. No, no. I wouldn't say endemic because there are nudibranchs other places too. There's just a lot of them are found in the Philippines, and mm -hmm. then there's a lot in San Francisco. But I think they go basically where they can survive and like where they have the most um, resources. Like I think there's nudibranch in Australia too, but a lot are in the Philippines, which is I think is really cool. And like yeah. you know, the locations are localities that I'm looking at this summer so far. A bunch of the beautiful islands on the Philippines. Look at these islands; they're really really beautiful. And the pictures I'm going to show you are just the ones I found. Just just four from the a hundred I found on the Luzon island from I think it's Bantangas, which is beautiful so let's dive into the nudibranchs yes yeah, sea slugs yeah. it's so funny because i always my like family doesn't know what a nudibranch is so i'm like oh sea slugs are just sea slugs but <laughs> they're like just more than sea slugs and they're so beautiful so this one i literally can't pronounce but i just have a scientific name there just to show you just in case anybody wants to look up the specifics because there is 
so many new to bring and the scientific thing really matters when it comes to them. Yeah. This one that was found on Luzon Island. I think it's super pretty. It's pink and so vibrantly colored. And I just, I love that. This one looks the most like a, a sea slug to me. Yeah. So they're like kind of related to land slugs too, right? Like sea yeah, slugs. Yeah, they're all part of the same, uh, they all come from the same hierarchy one. I okay. Which one. Um, but mollusks normally have like shells. So like you think of a mollusk like being like a clam, but these aren't, they don't have a shell. They're very soft shells and they're invertebrates. But they're so beautiful and they're still close related, which is really interesting because we were looking at like phylogenetics in our um, classes for this internship. So I love that. Because at first I would have been like, that's not a mollusk. There's no, there's no shell. Like, that's impossible. <laughs> but then looking at this taxonomy and like looking at the um, phylogenetics of it, you can see how they evolved and like, where they lost the shell in their lifetime or why yeah. some snails got it, why land snails have cells, but like sea slugs don't. Mm -hmm. That's Do you have an idea like when they evolved? When, <laughs> when they evolved, yeah. <laughs> no idea. Oh, there is so many, yeah. so many things in the evolutionary clock. But it's weird because they, they evolved at the, not the same time, but if you look at the ones in San Francisco and the ones on the Philippine coast, none of them have the shells on it so they must have either been in the same place or just both lost their shells at the same time i'm gonna research when what the when the divide was that's very interesting yeah i'm making my phylogenetic tree <laughs> super cool yeah these no. are it looks Wait. like a rock <laughs> that's why i thought it was interesting too oh can you hear me oh wow okay. yeah there you are there you are okay Okay, so this one looks like a rock, and I thought it was cool. Cause it's like a, it looks like a, a quartz. Wow. It's, it's a little boring. <laughs> so I it was uh, beautiful. Yeah. So so I know the word nudibranch has something to do with their gills, right? Like, like it means that their like gills are exposed or something. Do you know? I don't know if their gills are exposed. You can see the little antennas on some. Not they're not antennas, but like they have their little cute little antlers almost as you can see on this one too yeah the actual word nudibranch means but i should look that up that's a great question but i love saying it, nudibranch it's like it's a fun word to say. yeah pop quiz for everybody in the audience listening in go look up nudibranch tell us what it means in the comments <laughs> none of us are entirely sure what the nudibranch is yeah and this next little break I'm gonna show is literally my favorite. It looks like oh, well, it looks like a cat. Yeah, <laughs> it looks like so many things, but it's absolutely my favorite favorite one. I, when I first saw it, I was like, oh my goodness, it's a mini llama because like its little head <laughs> it has the body shape of a llama, but it's like this big and lives underwater, and the color is just so vibrant. I absolutely love it. Yeah, you can see like it's got little polka dots, and it just shows you like the beauty of our natural world. Yeah. It's the maze of the color. And I'm like curious like what in the world it eats because <laughs> I have no idea what makes it that color, but I'm trying I'm interested yeah. in the diet of the uh, Brotha Cristata, but it's absolutely my favorite. I remember when I first got accepted in this internship, I was looking up nudibranchs and I was like, oh, that is so cute. I hope I see one like a tide pool somewhere <laughs> at the museum. I'm gonna literally print this picture out and hang it on my wall. Yeah. So okay, like these um these colors and they're carnivores, so like is the color does the color help them like ward off other predators or something? Do you know like I'm sure especially this one, the neon colors has to help them ward off predators because it looks poisonous. If you guys know, I'm sure you guys do know, but most animals that have these neon colors are poisonous or animals think they're poisonous, such as like a poison dart frog is like a neon orange. So I'm sure this helps protect it from prey being eaten because I would think that was poisonous. If I was like a fish. <laughs> I would not want to eat that. That's <laughs> terrifying. But it's absolutely my favorite. I love him. He's just like ugh, little, little creatures, and they're so beautiful. Yeah. Cool. Thanks so much. This is the last one I have, and so I like this one because it was light blue <laughs> and wow. my favorite color. <laughs> and it was also another one of the Luzon Island. And I'm just so amazed that all four of these creatures. Are literally living in the same place. Yeah. Existing together and they're just in our oceans being beautiful. And most people don't even know they're there, but they're so they're so pretty. I just love like how that one is like light blue and they all vary in the way they look. So that shows you the diversity in our waters 
and it really helps you the, help the emphasis on how much we need to protect our oceans and protect our coral reefs yes. and do more because you don't want to lose such beautiful creatures like this yeah. or and have just one homogeneous animal like you want to have mm -hmm. such a great diversity and yeah so that's the nudibranchs i have i have other slides that tell more about me but I'll let you guys ask some questions first. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for sharing all those photos. They're such gorgeous little creatures. Um, so this one's also kind of related to nature, this question. Um, do you have a particular favorite memory with nature or like time that you were outside and just really loved it and stuck with you? Oh, oh like a particular there favorite time with nature? Oh, I have so many. Um, so my favorite one, I think I've told this story before and um, was one of the SSI people. So I went to Cancun, like, I think five years ago, five years ago. And so they have this big park there called, it's called Ishkret, I think it's pronounced. And so Ishkret was absolutely beautiful. They have like underwater caves that you can swim through. But like my favorite thing is they had like this big, 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 big outside building and it was like a bird encounter. And so I'm used to zoos in the city because I'm near the city slash suburb. And they keep the birds in cages and you can't touch them. And so like, you just kind of like, look at them suffering inside. But so when I went to this little bird encounter, all the birds were like walking around free. <laughs> there was like no cages. And it wasn't just like little small like robins. It was like huge like parrots and like the tiny little parakeets. I was like so amazed. And I was like, I didn't know there's so many birds. <laughs> birds in the world. And I was like, what, 14? But it was just so beautiful to me like, parrots like fly around because I had just seen parrots in pictures at that point. I've never actually seen like a parrot living its life freely. And they were literally just like walking next to me. They like they weren't scared and like I was terrified. I know it's happening. But I was also like amazed and I was like like look at all these birds. Like they're so beautiful. <laughs> just like flying around like the the way like parrots have like red and like blue and green all on their body at once is like I'm a big color person. You'll come to see I love colors. And so parrots are just like the epitome of being like colorful and like funky and like like the funky birds of the world. I just love it so much. So <laughs> yeah. that's memorable nature memories I ever had just because it was so new and exciting. And though I was like a little bit scared, I was just like in awe of like the natural world and like seeing all these different species of birds just like flying around me free without being captive. Yeah. We would love to see some of your colorful, funky like yes. what you just alluded to i'll bring your slides back up you want to yes, i love it so as aria knows i love um fashion and i'll first i'll start off with the first slide so you just you can see me so there i am that was an outfit i actually wore like two days ago um, <laughs> the name money i'm you new to bring and so here is amber how did you um i mean like can you maybe like tell us a little bit about what it's like being a scientist who likes fashion because i know there's like a lot of like you know yeah on that. it's interesting because when people meet me especially at my university they never like realize how like deep and like into fashion i am but they're always like wait a minute this girl is so smart like what in the world she's doing all of this and it's always like with me like sometimes i'm afraid to tell people that i'm so into fashion because with scientists they're not really that deeply into their clothes but me i love I love fashion. It's more about like the expression of myself and I like to wear the colors that I, I'm feeling that day. And so this morning I had on bright orange dress and I put it on and I felt really nice in it. And that's why I love Paris. I love nudibranchs because they're so, they're so colorful and beautiful. And there are sometimes people like when I walk into like my organic chemistry classes or my human genetics or my zoology classes, they're like, oh, there's a highlighter there. Like, what did she do? <laughs> <laughs> and half the time, too, my hair is like bright colors. Like, you'll see another some other pictures. I've had a white hair. I've had green. Hair. Yeah, show us, show us. <laughs> I have. I just really love expressing myself. Like, there's me in green. My head, from that picture on the far far left, I have head to toe green. On my hair was green. My shirt was green. My shorts were green. Oh, so and awesome. I, I love it too. And just. And so even though sometimes I used to be afraid to like express myself with my clothes in front of other scientists, now I'm just like, hey, I know I'm a smart person. Just because I like beautiful clothes doesn't mean that you think I'm any less than a scientist because your clothes don't determine who you are. They're just your expression of yourself. And like, I love expressing myself. And so 
I'm never going to stop. And one thing I'm really interested in one day, if I ever get the chance, is making like a brand that combines like fashion and like science together. I remember I had this dream. I was like, I'm going to make rainbow colored lab coats for the world to see. Oh, man. Yeah, I'd, I'd buy the heck out of that. Are you kidding me? That's that's so good. <laughs> <laughs> My white lab coat. I was like, oh, I feel so boring. But I know it's supposed to protect me. So I was like, well, why don't I just make rainbow colored lab coats one day and like <laughs> for everybody? Or for like nurses too. I want I know they have some type of scrubs, but I know some scrubs have to be up to code, but like I also would love to design like cute scrubs for nurses to wear. Yeah. <laughs> or cute boots for people to wear with their expeditions for biological things yeah oh i love that yeah you i love like yeah you're a great scientist and also just happen to have a killer fashion sense like just make the rest of us jealous like it's fine <laughs> but yeah right, hello. Uh, i'm gonna ask you another question it's uh how has the black lives matter movement impacted you as a person or and as a scientist as well well as you guys can see, I am black. So it means it's impacted me in very many ways. And like I mentioned before, my main major at my university is sociology. sociology. So Black Lives Matter, police brutality, like mass integration, is something I've been talking about forever now. And sometimes you feel like no one hears you, especially at my university in my science courses. I'm sometimes the only black person and sometimes even the only person of color. So when movements like this get more attention, I listen very closely to what my science peers have to say. And so the response from this incident for Black Lives Matter has been much better than the old one because currently right now at my school, I am um, in a club called Black Students in STEM. So the College of Science actually reached out to the Black Students in STEM to help us draft ways to make science more inclusive for black students on our campus and just in the future in general. And so this movement has not only affected me just in my own home, but like in my way I interact with my university too now and that I'm actually able to be a part of change for the science community. Because sometimes sciences, they get so focused in their work that they forget that the social sciences need help too and that there are things happening in the world and so sometimes they don't really focus on that. They just focus on the research. I remember I was watching the SpaceX launch and the scientist was talking about, oh, we should be focusing on the space launch instead of everything going on in society. And to me, I was like, well, I'm both black and a scientist, so I have to focus on both. And so I just wish more people could focus on both and see that the, there is value in focusing on both issues. And so, yeah, that's, it's both, it's really important and really crucial to me. I've been to two protests and I've actually been out to see the Black Lives Matter way in front of the White House and stuff like that. So it's sad that it's happening, but it's there's some good things out of recent that have came up from it. And so I'm glad that scientists are finally taking a stand against systemic racism and trying to be more inclusive for not only Black students, but just color in general. Yeah. And it's like science doesn't happen in a bubble, you know, like, I think that's like such a big thing that's kind of started or I mean, it, it has been discussed for a while and people have been saying it for a while. But now more people are starting to realize that indeed science doesn't happen in a bubble. So. So, yeah. Um, thanks so much for sharing. Amber, yeah. And it's so many black people have made so many great contributions to science. Like one of my favorite films yes. in the world is Hidden Figures. And those were black women getting us on the moon so it's important that scientists recognize the black struggle because we've done a lot for the scientific community and everything mm -hmm. and so if they fail to recognize us and they shouldn't really have the right to recognize the achievements that we've done for the world yeah yeah i just wish people could yeah. say that science isn't just <clears throat> it's a sphere and that their intersectionality is very important to me and that science and social issues correlate yeah absolutely yeah thanks so much for sharing ember um yeah we love hearing your perspective uh 
And just to wrap this show up, kind of getting towards the end here, um, this is kind of a fun question. If, I mean, not to say that the other ones aren't fun, but like <laughs> completely like switching gears here. <laughs> um, if you could travel anywhere in the universe, where would you go and why? Oh, anywhere in the universe. That's a beautiful question. Well, we didn't even say multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> in the multiverse oh if it was a multiverse i would definitely go to um what's called the dc comics universe i'm a big <gasps> uh, big superhero fan but anywhere in the universe i'd say i, I really want to go to jupiter like if i was able to travel to jupiter that would be a dream come true there jupiter and saturn because jupiter and saturn y'all they have some killer weather <laughs> They have, they have <laughs> storms of epic proportions, and I truly want to see that. <laughs> I was watching it, and it was like three threatening storm. And Wait, like, Amber, sorry, could you repeat that? I think we lost you there for a sec. Oh, okay, no problem. I was watching. Uh, it was like a video. It's like, what happens if you fall into Jupiter? And it's like you have to go through like three lightning storms, a hailstorm. <laughs> and I was like, that's crazy. But if I couldn't live through it, I would want to go. God, I just couldn't imagine that. I get scared at like two inches of rain. So like imagine like uh, <laughs> of Australia. Like that's crazy. <laughs> if it could be like on the world, my dream is to go to Japan one day. So yeah. And <laughs> and Saturn. I, I absolutely love that. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Amber, for hopping on this live stream with us and sharing your thoughts and perspective. We've absolutely loved chatting with you. And to everybody listening in, we've got our social media handles linked below, um, both Twitter and Instagram. Noah, you want to talk about those? Oh, yes, we, those accounts, there's like where I would share. I mean, we're new to this. Um, to the live streams and also to the Instagram and Twitter. But in the following weeks, we're going to be posting about our interns, myself, my intern. We're, we're going to be talking about them and sharing more, I guess, personal stuff about them. And I'm also about that program as well. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So yeah, give us a follow and we've got another live stream coming up on, another couple live streams coming up on Wednesday. If you wanna tune in, hear some more about the people behind the science happening through this program and at the Academy of Sciences in general. And yeah, thanks again, Amber, for coming on uh, and to everybody watching, have a great day, stay safe. See you later. Bye.